when we were first married, we were young, we didn't have the money, and we only lived in flats for the first couple of years until we came to here, and this was our first home, and to me, it will always be my home. Val Jackson has been lucky. For much of the year, unfavourable winds churn up the seas around Tasman Island and make the rock impossible to get near. Landings and rough weather have claimed lives over the years. It's only four hours steaming to Hobart, but Tasman Island is one of the most inaccessible of all the lighthouses around Australia's coastline, operated by the federal government. Most of them are unmanned automatic beacons, but the really crucial ones, on dangerous coastlines like the south of Tasmania, are run by lightkeeper families. And for most of the year, the three families who live on the top of this rock are left to themselves. Every lighthouse gives out a different light. This one flashes every five seconds, so any captain who sees the light looks it up in his manual and knows he's off Tasman Island. And more than one worried skipper has Jack Jackson to thank for keeping the light burning for the past quarter century. This tower was erected in about 1906. It's about a thousand feet high. Most people think, you know, it's here just because there's a rock here, but it's not. It's a navigational aid. It's a beautiful tower. It's probably be here for another hundred years. It's a kerosene-operated light. And uh, beautiful prisms, hand ground made in England, Birmingham. And it's manned by three chaps. We keep a continuous watch. The interior of the tower is steel, steel floors, steel walls. And I can tell you, it's damn cold up here at night. There's something like 200 steps and four landings. And if there's any women that have got a weight problem, well, I can advise them if they run up and down these two or three times a day like I do, they won't have any weight problems whatsoever. I've offered to... Uh, put the wife on this sort of training, but she's not very interested. I came out of the army in 53 and looked around. Father-in-law wanted me to go on the farm or orchard down the channel with him. But I decided that although they're good in-laws, the further away from in-laws you are, the better, in my opinion. I seen this job advertised and applied. And I had them pick out of either Tasman Island or Matt Saigra Island, and I took Tasman Island.
A hundred miles around the coast from Tasman is Matsika Island. And here another lighthouse and its three keeper families have to be supplied by ship and by small boat. The head keeper here is John Cook. What's the significance of this, this operation? Well, this gives us our fuel, our stores, our and a power source like a kerosene. Gives you everything. Gives you everything, yeah, for the next six months or so. It's your lifeline. Yeah. What would happen if the storm blew up? We've, uh, in, we've lost stores coming in here many a time. When the uh, mail boats arrive, and you, you can't see the boats, you can't see anything here. They're just a mass of white water. It's a rather peculiar way to get your food, isn't it? Yeah, it's not mainly fuel, but it's our coal that we keep our fires going with. We nearly had a coal this time, and we only had a few bags left. If the pillar had been late this time, well, we would have been out of coal. It's, a, it's our total, you know, it's our heating and cooking everything. And of course, you need kerosene for the light and your um, diesel for your engines. In other words, you're totally dependent on this place, aren't you? On this particular boat for these large bulk stores, yeah. So difficult is the job of supplying both Tasman and Matsika that the government has decided to take all the families off to make both lights automatic and so end a way of life that has changed very little in almost a century. First on the list is Tasman Island. This is, is a rock, it's about a thousand foot high and it's about oh, half a mile by a quarter. We've got about 20 trees on top and this either side of me and where I'm walking now is just marsh. Would you believe a marsh on top of a thousand foot rock? And um, we've got a tractor here for transport, coal, briquettes and stuff. But we've only got about bloody 60 yards of track. This is the track that I'm walking along. Before, about 20 years ago, I was here for two years and we had uh, a horse and he was a bloody character too. It wasn't anything he wouldn't do. He'd be walking down here where I am now. He'd bail you up and if you had no bread or a bit of cake for him, you wouldn't get past. Or he'd be hauling the truck up the haulage way, a bloody thousand foot long, and he'd get halfway up and he'd decide to turn around and go the other way for Christ's sake. Now you'd be going back down the haulage instead of up. All these sort of things, turning bloody taps on, letting all the water out the tanks. There was no end of things he used to get up to. The women were frightened to go between houses because he'd bail them up. But now he's dead and we've got the tractor here to do his labour for him. So things are improving as we get along, but that's 20 years ago I'm talking about. Island discovered by Tasman in 1642 when he discovered Tasmania. It's a pretty spot. The trees and the birds. This part over here used to be an Aboriginal midden. The Aborigines came from over the mainland. There's still a lot of uh, their seal bones and flints there. It's beautiful. Light's been here since 1890. A chap named Duff constructed the light from Hobart. 1890, and, and uh, it's been going ever since. Been three families continuously on the island all the time. I've been here just over three years now. Loved every minute of it. Vegetation's pretty short just around here because of the wind, but it gets much thicker as we get up higher. Soil isn't very deep. 18 inches, two feet in places. In the gullies, it's deeper. We've even got man ferns in some of the gullies. The birds congregate up high. We've got parrots, terns, scrub wrens, tits. Numerous seabirds, and of course, this time of the year, the mutton birds are here. And all the 
this the tea tree's coming out in flower now. As a matter of fact, it was a tea tree that gave it, it got its name from. I, I believe that Tasman, when he saw it, it must have been about this time of the year that he saw it. It was all out in flower, and he called it Matsuka. And I believe this means a mountain of sugar. vegetables you grow? Uh, a wide variety of vegetables, so peas, potatoes, radishes, lettuce, cabbage, collies, silver beet, and we have tomatoes out on the front veranda. Um, Are you self-sufficient in, in fresh food or do you have to get a fair bit sent across? We're self-sufficient in the growing season. Um, Jack might put in two or three gardens because of the wind, because of the, the high winds and the salt. What do they do? Well, the, the winds just burn it, burn it off, and then you just start again. But um, during the, uh, the summer months, um, till about April, May, we'd say we're self-sufficient. Um, do you entertain much up here? I mean, do you sort of have each other over for tea and so on? Uh, we, on this island, we only entertain really for special occasions. We, we don't live in each other's pockets. Uh, mail day is our once a day, once a fortnight day. We, might, we all get together here, um, open the mail, have a bit of afternoon tea. If it's a nice day, we go for a walk down to the... or may even go down to the landing if it's a nice day. Uh, we make an occasion. Um, other times, at birthdays, we always, the women, we get dressed up. We, just like anyone in town or any area it's going out, we get dressed up and go. Our long frocks. Are, are, there, are there sort of very popular lighthouse postings? Uh, I mean, th this one apparently at Matsaika, everyone says at Matsaika, oh, we hate to live at, at Tasman, it's just a bloody great rock. Well, I wouldn't like to live at Matsaika, it's always too much wind. But Matsaika has advantages that the children can go and swim. says through Ethiopia's mountain runs the deep African rift valley, a massive trough which contains several lakes. Now remember we're talking about the moving plates? Well Lisa can say it if you like. Mm. The real work on lighthouse islands uh, is from dusk to dawn and apart from routine maintenance the families have the daytime to themselves. On Tasman Island Bob and Deirdre Eichen spend much of it in school with their children. The Icons are gentle fugitives from a mainland rat race they found difficult to handle. Tasman Island for them is not a job, it's a temporary refuge.
Actually, I'm the honorary ranger down here now. It's uh, just another interest I've got, and it, this includes that I'm, I'm uh, responsible for the protection of all wildlife in this area on the Matsaka Group. That includes the seals, which are just over on our left over here. Uh, there have been cases where they have been shot indiscriminately, and this makes us pretty wild. And we uh, sort of stop the sort try to stop it wherever we can. And now that we'll have the authority to do this, we can we can police it in a better fashion. Oh, this is this is a mutton bird. It's, or it's one of the shearwater family. It's uh, the sooty tailed and the short tailed shearwaters. This is approximately I've been told three million of these on the island. And this, this could be the male or the female, but it's sitting on the egg at the present moment, which is just about the grandest there. And all around here, there's the, the mutton birds are congregating. And the whole island's a nesting ground for them. And they're a migratory bird, of course. And they arrive on the 23rd of September. You can practically set your clock on them. Usually around about that evening, we see them coming by the swarms on the 23rd of September. And they leave later on in the, in the new year, <coughs> after they've laid their eggs. And they fly across the Pacific and round over through Japan and back down and arrive back the following September and go back to the same nest. Well, back in there, little fella. Back to your egg. This is a low crossing this day, the typical storm that comes up this coast. It'll be ring rain, probably strong wind, and it was forecast. We get a lot of these storms. Um, this coast is uh, well known for, to be one of the roughest and rugged, most rugged coasts in Australia, or the world in that matter. You can start feeling the wind increasing as the front, low front comes over. Rain clouds are appearing. Very shortly, it won't be any place to be on this balcony, I can tell you that. And I won't be, I can tell you that. This is an ordinary pressure lamp. It's um, the same as the main light. It's just a pump-up lamp with a pressure uh, mantle which lights up. And the same principle has been around for years. As a matter of fact, we use that for an emergency when we have a failure in the main light. The light has contracted into these prisms, which you can see, and they sure cost a penny, pretty penny today. But the principle is that the light beams are bent into the centre of the ball and then transmitted out to the sea. The light itself is lit by lighting this um, heating lamp, which is full of methylated spirits, are placed under the lamp. Right, now the light is ignited by lighting this taper, turning on the, vape, the kerosene, which is now vaporised. Of course, the whole bloody thing would be a lot easier if we had electric light and a switch, but I suppose this is a bit picturesque.
Now the light has slowly brought, but brought up to a steady glow by adjustment on this valve. How many times do you think that you set up in a place like this and watch that thing go around in well, 20 odd years? It'd be impossible to say, but a bloody lot longer than I'd like to. Within the year, Tasman and Matt Syker Islands will probably go automatic. Jack Jackson will take it in his stride, but not John Cook. Cook's boyhood ambition was to be a naval officer. He never made it. And after years of dead-end jobs, he joined the lighthouse service and finally found his niche. We don't get as much shipping here as what we did at Tasman. But there again, we're on a coast that hasn't got any lights on it. As far east as you look, there's no lights. As far west as you look, there's no lights. There's no one living on the mainland. And... Um, you realise that your light, even your, your lights in your house, are a beacon to shipping, you know? On a, on a rough night, the ship can be coming eastward bound from the west. He may be a, a liner, maybe a coaster. He might only be a small vessel without the luxury of radar or uh, all these modern appliances. And he comes around the southwest cape and there's that light. He knows straight away where he is. If a ship's coming from South Africa, Cape Town, maybe. He's got his, uh, all his um, latest uh, gear to give him a fix. He probably even got Decker, for that matter. But when he sees that light, this light up here, he knows exactly where he is. He can't look along the coastline to see a, some small township. There's nothing there. So on a dark night, the only thing that he will see is this light. A lot of chaps probably wouldn't um, go much on because you, you've got to come down here every night, every night of the year. There's, there's no, you can't say, well, look, I'm going to have Saturday night off. You can't say, well, look, it's Christmas Eve, I'm going to have Christmas Eve off. Doesn't matter whether it's Christmas Eve or Good Friday, you, you still got that light's got to be lit every night. But the, if you didn't light it, it just, that probably could be the night that there's some cruise liner was going past and even with all its um, latest electronic equipment, could clobber the needles. Where would that put a blade? You, you, you get the impression that, that um, say, lighthouse keeper, right? He's miles away from anywhere. He gets, you know, a boat comes every month or something like that, and they sort of let their hair grow and let their beards grow and and, uh, and wear daggy old clothes because who would care? Who would ever see them? Well, this is true. This is up in chap's own mind. I mean, you've got to control your own self-discipline, don't you? I feel you've got to discipline yourself. This is right, isn't it? Mm. If you could, you could let yourself go completely if you wanted to. Do people do that sometimes? Oh, yes. Yes. Quite a lot, quite a lot of times, you know, you see women let themselves go. Where they're dressing down for lunchtime and, and just slop in an old pair of jeans around the place. Um, I try to keep myself like I would in town. Do you find you have to work harder at a relationship with your husband? I mean, you say you keep the other two families at a, a bit of a distance. That means that for 365 days a year, all the time, all day, you're living with a man. You never get away from him. Very seldom. I suppose the longest we're apart is a couple of hours a day. Because I come down the tower every night with John. Uh, I usually wash up and come down, bring him down a drink. And we sit here from about... Well, I sit here with John from about oh, 9 o'clock to 11. No, we... We don't have to work at it. I mean, little things can become big things when you... Uh, 
we're little funny things, like John might say something and it comes out the wrong way. But of course this happens in every marriage. Sometimes it appears that, um, that this is some sort of temple, you know, that you come in here and you worship. I mean, everything's polished, everything's painted, everything's immaculate. And it's just that thing up there that keeps on revolving. And it almost seems like you're its, its servants, you know, that it has some sort of power over you. Yes, but I, it, I think it has. Hmm? I think it has got some sort of power over us. Um, I don't know. What would you say? I don't know. It's well, like it a... rules our life, anyway. Let's face it. I mean, it's like a living thing, really, isn't it? You you come to life every night. Every night it bursts out in the brightness. You can hear its noise. It's going there all night, ticking away. He loves it. Mm. Polishing it and cleaning his prisons. And... I think he'd die if he didn't have it. <laughs> I think he'd miss the light more than he'd miss me. <laughs> Is that right, John? Well, I suppose it would be, yeah. <laughs> you, you go up there and you, you give it this brilliance, you know, and this, this light covers thousands of square miles of water, you know. Bingo, she's a brightness, you know, it's a flash. Every, everyone in that area can see it. You, you, you've given something to someone, haven't you? It's a very guiding light. People used to put candles in windows once. You're, you're away from the rat race, I suppose, but in many ways, you, the rat race, well, some of it's good. I mean, you're, you're away from everything, though, aren't you? You're completely isolated. But is that good in, in, in some ways? It's good for me. It's, uh, I, it's, uh, why do you need contact? I mean, we get our basic needs, we get our food supplied, and if uh, our health's good, we only get colds when visitors come here. And overall, the, the health of practically everyone on the island and the station is always good. The children are healthy. But the world's and, going past you. But what in the world is going past us? I mean, you're born, you live and you die. Why not live the way you want to live? When death arrives, it, it doesn't matter what's happened in the past, that's it. Unless you've got some ambition you want to fulfill, it, you're, um, some great ambition like you want to leave behind you a monument of some description. We're an only, uh, animals have passed through this world and become extinct and man passes through this world and some leave something behind and others don't leave anything. Probably I'll leave a mark in this lighthouse, I don't know. 